Japanese are on the, the, uh, the north uh, west portion of the island, and they're all looking into the uh, to the Savo Sound. Nobody sees the burning plane. In fact, the Japanese headquarters on uh, Guadalcanal radios Goto and tells him that the the sound is free of Allied shipping. But Scott believes that his force has been uh, revealed, and he acts accordingly. At six, uh, or, I'm sorry, at 8 p.m., all the ships go to general quarters, and at 9:15, all the the ships in the task force form uh, formation dog, which was essentially, you know, a, a column based, you know, uh, rem re reminiscent of the age of sail. Uh, Scott places three of his destroyers in the in the van in the, in the front, uh, led by Fahrenholt, uh, which was the flagship of Destroyer Squadron 12. Uh, commanded by Robert Tobin. So it was Fahrenheit, Duncan, Laffey, then the flagship San Francisco. Uh, behind San Francisco was um, Boise, Salt Lake City, Helena, and then the two trailing destroyers, Buchanan and McCullough. Okay, at a little, at uh, 2300, um, San Francisco's float plane, who is now flying over Tassa Faranga Point, and dropping flares, parachute flares, illuminating the Japanese ships in, in, at Anchorage, says that there is one large and two small ships unloading at Tassafaranga Point. So here is Scott's second quandary. He believes he's been discovered, the cruiser float plane incident, and now he's only, he's just sighted, his float planes have, just, uh, have uh, located just a fraction of the ships that he expected to see. So the question is, where are the others? A little after, well, it's actually, it's better here. A little after 11 o'clock, the force rounds the northern coast of Guadalcanal. Again, that was Cape Esperance, and assumes a patrol position um, this way <laughs> towards towards Savo Island. And at 11:25, Helena. Helena, who is equipped with the most the most modern SG radar, identifies an unmistakable surface contact co contact 15 miles to its port beam, which is north, seaward up the slot, not south towards the island, which is down here. However, Helena does not does not report this to the flagship. Uh, Captain Hoover, Gilbert Hoover, the Helena, uh, says later that he believed that the flagship would be in possession of the same information. The, the San Francisco did have radar. It was the less capable SC-type radar, which was better for spotting incoming air aircraft than it was for uh, surface contacts. But Scott had ordered that the radio be turned or the radar be turned off. Seven minutes later, Scott is concerned about his proximity to Savo Island, which is approximately here, and he orders his, col his, uh, his column to make a turn, 180 de uh, degree turn, a counter march, back along the same uh, path he was traveling. And at this point, the column splits into two. So, you know, historians have debated the reason, the reason for this, but the, the fact is, that the the the, the van destroyers, the, the Fahrenheit, Duncan, and Laffey, continue sailing for another three minutes, while uh, they notice that the that the flagship and the the trailing sh uh, cruisers have turned. So Scott gets on the radio and he asks Tobin. He said, asks him if he intends to retake the lead of the column. Apparently, he asked it in such a way that it wasn't a question. <clears throat> and Tobin orders speed increase to 29 knots so that he can pass, he can speed past the cruisers and you know pull up in front of them. Yeah. 17 minutes after Helena's initial uh, radar contact, he finally reports it. And he's and uh, 
uh, Hoover Hoover uh, tells Scott that he has a uh, radar contact, a surface contact, eight miles to his starboard. So now Scott's now Scott's getting worried. Okay, Scott was expecting to find the Japanese heat down here and on uh, on the uh, coast, the north coast of Guadalcanal. He now has a Japanese force to his starboard, and worse yet, his destroyers, uh, Fahrenheit, Laffey, and Duncan, now are between his cruiser column and the Japanese. Well, to make matters worse, to add to the confusion now, um, Boise, who also has the, the SG radar, confirms Helena's contact, but he describes it as a bogey. The bogey, which was the code word that was used to describe, to de describe an aerial, an unidentified aer aerial combat, uh, contact. So now Scott thinks there's, uh, there's ships and there's planes. Boise's radar, radio operator uses relative as opposed to true or magnetic directions. So now, so Boise is reporting a contact that doesn't make sense to, to Scott based on its bearing. And now Scott is certain that Boise is targeting Duncan. Twenty-one minutes after the initial contact, uh, Helena asks for permission to open fire. Scott's not ready to do that. He gets. He, uh, he is concerned about the. He's concerned about his destroyers. Uh, he's not ready to. He's not ready to to, to uh, initiate contact. In fact, I guess one of the signalmen on board the bridge of the Helena asked the Cap Captain Hoover if he believed that. Uh, Scott intended to board the Japanese ships. They were very close now. <laughs> they were uh, in, le the, in less than eight miles. So Helena asks for permission to fire. Scott responds with the words, interrogatory Roger, which means I have received your message and I understand it. However, Helena, again, who's um, who is complaining about voice communications all night, uses that as permission to open fire and initiates contact, initiates its five inch uh, turrets, its five inch guns st launch star shells at the Japanese and its uh, six inch guns open fire. Within three minutes, everyone in the column is, tr is, is, is uh, shooting. Scott tries to cease pop fire, but he's not successful in doing that. So he gets on the radio to Tobin and asks him if his destroyers are okay. And Tobin says, we're fine, but we don't know who you're shooting at. The, the destroyers do not have radar. Let's see what we're forgetting here. All right. In terms of naval gunnery in, 19, in, in 1942, two miles is considered point blank range. <clears throat> And you will see that the uh, that the Japanese are much much closer than that, <laughs> much much closer than that. At the moment that the uh, hostilities open, the Japanese are sailing in three parallel columns. The first column has the heavy cruisers, Aoba, the flagship in the lead, Furutaka, Kinugasa, with Fubuki, the being the southernmost ship, and Hatsuyuki, the destroyer, being the northernmost ship. So when hostilities commence, the Japanese are not even at general quarters. It's at midnight, it was Goto's, Goto's intention that they would go to general quarters, that they would prepare for a bombardment mission on Guadalcanal. The, the few, first few salvos in the gun hoists were all the thin-skinned bombardment munitions. They were not the kind of bullets that you use against armored warships. They were, they were thin-skinned um, bombardment munitions intended to destroy soft targets, marines, <laughs> <laughs> aircraft, <laughs> things like that. So when, uh, when, <laughs> when hostilities are initiated, Goto is almost as surprised as Scott that, the sh that, that these ships are opening fire. 
and first the star shells and then a deluge of six and eight inch shells strike the flagship and wreck its top sides. And Goto is mortally wounded and would die the next day. <clears throat> However, um, at, at this moment, Go, uh, Goto is convinced that he's being fired upon by Joshima's ships. He thinks this is a friendly fire incident, and he withholds gunfire for seven critical minutes. That seven minutes make all the difference. In addition, he has his signalman uh, flash, I am Aoba, I am Aoba, trying to stop what he thinks is a friendly fire incident. Well, you can imagine how what the, what the American gunners thought of that, like, here, hit me, hit me, hit me. And so the top sides of, of the Japanese flagship is completely wrecked. The trailing cruiser uh, Furutaka sees that the flagship is, is, is taking withering fire and actually intervenes, drives between the flagship and the Americans, and as a result receives, I think about, I think it was 44 six and eight inch um, uh, hits. So at this point, Goto's fairly certain that he is not going to um, be able to stop what he thinks is a friendly fire incident. So he orders his ships to get the hell out of Dodge, make an immediate, uh, make a turn. However, he does not order a simultaneous turn, which would have, which would have had every ship at the moment the order was given turn and get out. Instead, what he ordered was say, it's called a column turn. So it's like it's like driving your car around a corner. Every ship in the in the column makes a right make a makes a turn at the very same spot in the water. Yes, As in just range in on the first and keep shooting at that spot. Well, that's precisely what happens. So here, you know, um, they they could have they, these ships. They are the Japanese ships are continuing to fight to to sail into this uh, withering gunfire when they could have turned three minutes ago uh, gotten away. So uh, so basically what happens is that the ship gets to a certain point in the water, turns. The, the trailing ship gets to that same point in the water and then turns. So a, as a result, Fubuki is completely destroyed. It completely, it doesn't even, it's sunk in three minutes before it even completes its turn. As I mentioned, Aoba, its top sides are wrecked. Goto is mortally wounded, but it actually survives to fight another day. For Utaka, primarily because it, inter it interdicted, the, got between the, the Americans and the flagship, takes 44 hits and sinks about 20 minutes later. Kinugasa and Hatsuyuki, however, rather than turning uh, to uh, starboard, in the same general direction as the American column, makes a port turn and escapes relatively unhit, unscathed, uh, by making a port turn and, and extending in the other direction. 